Hello, and welcome to the Nostalgia Podcast. A podcast where we discuss the retelling or continuation of pop culture favorites as seen through a queer and feminist lens. My name's Eric Lefebri. And I'm Jessica Gisera. And this week we watched Judge Dread. Dread. <laughs> <laughs> and Dread. Judge Dread and Dread. You like what I did there? I did. Uh, <laughs> Dread. <laughs> it's just the deeper voice. <laughs> because not only was it called Judge Dread and Dread, but it was also kind of dreadful. I was going to say... I can't express to you how much I was dreading. <laughs> Wait, how long films. did it take you to watch both movies today? Like nine hours, I think. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Yeah, I had to take a lot of breaks. <laughs> it's wild because I remember like people sitting me down and saying, "Okay, you have not seen Judge Dredd. You have to. You have to watch this. Yeah. You have to watch this. Oh my god!" Yeah, and. Yeah, like, and back then I was like, oh, cool. Like, I mean, and still, like, stylistically and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, the f- costumes for the first one were done by Versace, which is that cod piece. We will get into that because yeah. that is probably the best part of them. <laughs> was that costume? That costume was absolutely stunning. That was crazy. It was really cool. But yeah, so I had seen <laughs> both of these before. I forgot that I watched Dread because it just was immediately wiped from my memory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and rightfully so. Because <laughs> that movie was a... Um, okay, I don't want to get this wrong when I phrase it this way. An actual mess is what that movie was. Yes. Yeah. Um, cool. Great. Yeah, so um, you hadn't seen either of these before, I hadn't right? seen either, no. Okay. This was a first sitting. I watched them both today. I'm so sorry. Again, this is the entirety of my day, <laughs> uh, which is fine. You know, I'm just dreaded up. It's super sick. But, yeah, I watched them both for the first time today. I had seen clips to some extent, and I understand that there is, like, a lot of... um, Law. Law, yes. (laughs) There's a lot of fan-based law, lore and law, um, within it. So I I just... I had never actually seen either, because I don't think I was really that interested in, like, a movie about cops. (laughs) (laughs) In that way, where it's just, you know, so I was definitely, like, turned off by it. But I'm happy I watched them, because then we get to have a really in-depth conversation about it, and its themes, and intent, and all that, so it's going to be cool. Are you ready? I think so. Here we go. (laughs) Okay, great. (laughs) So, Judge Dredd, 1995. Yep. In a dystopian future, the majority of Earth has become uninhabitable forcing humanity to reside in megacities to survive. These megacities are governed and policed by the omnipowerful judges and the judges' council, who each act as the police, jury, and executioner. Judge Dredd, the celebrity judge in Mega City One, finds himself wrongly accused of murder and sets out on a path to prove his innocence. In the process, he uncovers a corrupt government plot and a sordid family past. Gratuitous law and grunts ensue. He is the judge. And this is his story. Insert bum bums. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, where to begin talk. is the question with this bad boy. It's a really good question to ask. I'm gonna begin with the opening. It starts with like all the comic book pages, just to remind all of us that yes, this is based on a comic book. I feel like that's where they got like the Marvel thing from right just like well, judge that, dread here's all the comics coming through, oh that aesthetic and then marvel yeah. just kind of took that as it's like intro title card yeah or whatever. but also disney owns marvel now yeah and disney also owns judge dread like at one point this was locked in the disney vault and it was this it, is a disney film this is a disney film it's a technically a buena vista but like but but that's disney wow yeah. judge dread is a prince <laughs> Apparently, he is Captain Falcon. Oh um, Rob Schneider was in this. Let's talk about that. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Rob Schneider was in this film. I had no idea. First of all, <laughs> so Rob Schneider's character, I feel like was okay. Well, we have a couple things to talk about right now because it's wild that his character exists and that it was him. Because initially, this was supposed to be. A serious film, like oh, and so the whole like sidekick slapsticky. Yeah, so because this was supposed to be dark and gritty and serious, yeah. and then Sylvester Stallone was like, 
No, no, this is an action comedy movie. I'm pretty sure. And he demanded rewrites or else he wasn't going to do it. In wow. So he like, he kind of like muscled his way in there. Yeah. But like, can you imagine it being super serious and then just having Rob fucking Schneider? <laughs> well, that would be tough. Like, cause he cannot cause, play a straight man. Well, and even before him, like the person they wanted for that role before him was Joe Pesci. <gasps> Stop. I I'm, would have lived for Joe Pesci in this. It was supposed to be Joe Pesci. That would and have he been it down. so cute. That would have been so cool. It was supposed to be directed by the Coen brothers, but they turned it down to do Fargo. Wow. Honestly, and wrong Christopher choice. Christopher Walken wrong choice. was supposed to be Rico, <laughs> and he turned it down. This would have been an entirely this different film. This would have been so different. That's wild. <laughs> oh, so, my God. So, Rob Schneider, I feel, his character was... Herman Fergie? Wait. Herman yeah, Fergie. Fergie. Herman Fergie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fergie. So, um, in the comics, Fergie lived in the Undercity, which is uh, the remains of the Eastern Seaboard. So, like, yeah. the mega cities were built on top of the ruins of the old cities. So, he lives so, like, kind of in that Undercity area. So, just like Futurama. Yeah, it's Sick. Futurama. Yes. It's, yeah, that's. I mean, I think it's canon. And he's like the top dog over all the other outcasts and mutants and stuff like that. So he's like kind of a badass in the comics. And mm-hmm. then they just turn him into like literally a comic relief character yeah. who just basically says everything that the audience is thinking. Because like as the audience, I was just kind of like, why do you do that? And then like Rob Schneider would be like, why are you doing that? And yeah. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. He is the, uh, la, 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 like the avatar for the audience. He's the entryway into the story. He's the... Yes, yes. Yeah. He was not... I don't... Okay, so I'm going to just go off the top. I did not like this movie at all. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I just didn't... So I had a hard time with the content because it felt like an unashamed, like pro police but like in a gross super duper like toxic way and even when it was just like oh there was like bad police in it it just felt like a not all blank conversation yeah. and narrative and i really didn't like that i also didn't like the whole idea of the judges and i know this isn't like it's not even the movie thing if like this is the lore of the comic books it's hard to do that but like the whole judges being like well i know everything it's it's back to the whole batman thing of like well, I'm just like a misunderstood strong man. I know everything. And how could I be wrong? It's just like straight white dudes pretending or not even pretending, thinking, truly thinking that they know everything and have the authority on it. But in this story, narratively, they've justified it by saying that like these judges have gone through the process. So therefore they know, but they're still just people. So but now they have the authority to kill at any given moment and destroy at any given moment. And then we're like, and that's we're supposed to be like be stoked on it and be stoked on Judge Dredd, who is like, like yes, yeah, sure. In that scene where the guy is drunk and like he gets him out of the car, he just like blows up his car. Sure, the guy's an asshole, and we're supposed to like there was by making that guy a stupid piece of shit asshole. We're supposed to then step back and be like, ooh, Judge Dredd's doing the cool thing by blowing up his car. And I was just like, fuck that. No, that's still terrible. He still blew up that guy's car. Get a tow. He's like, get a tow. And then he just yeah. shoots a gun at his car. And you're like, mm. Well, so that's interesting because I had kind of a different read. Oh, okay. That. So like I felt, and I think that this, like us having different viewpoints on this is, I think it's mostly because the the rewritings that we were talking about that yes. that happened and everything and how it didn't know if it wanted to be serious it didn't know if it wanted to be this like and it didn't know how it wanted to portray this character yeah so i feel like they were not trying to glorify like they were showing that he was a celebrity mm-hmm. but the whole time while he's doing these things i felt like and i think that this was shown through rob schneider's character right which when rob schneider is the voice of reason in a film there's a problem <laughs> But, like, he the whole time was like, why are you doing that? Like, he was just kind of, like, questioning everything that Judge Dredd did. Yeah. And I feel like the way that his his motives and how he was doing things was portrayed as just kind of like, you're supposed to, as the audience, not agree with it. Watching it now, I'm just like, no, you can't do that. Like, you're not supposed to do that. And, like, I think also, like, when Hershey comes in, the woman judge, right? Yeah. And she's she kind of questions him on things. And everything about the judges is supposed to be like they are the law but in their pursuit of following the law and following the rules there is no room for nuance there's no room for 
any sort of like gray area or yeah. anything. But like they forget that law and justice are two different things. Yeah. And so even though somebody broke the rules, for instance, when we're introduced to Judge Dredd's, he comes in, there's like this riot happening. He like gets rid of the people that are shooting people up from the building. And then he finds Rob Schneider's character. And Rob Schneider is just like, oh, well, I was just trying to hide. I wasn't actually with them, you know, and I was afraid that you were going to kill me. Rightfully so. Right. And he's like, well, you you're running from this and you shouldn't be doing that. He's like, my only other option was to jump out the window. He's like, yeah, you should have done that. He's like, I would have died. And he's like, but you wouldn't have broke any rules. Yeah. So like, there's no regard for human life at all. There's nothing about any of that. It's just like, either you follow the law or you die or you follow the law and you die still, you know? So there's no winning. And he thinks in just this black and white area and he literally can't see past that, even when he himself is wrongly accused. He's sitting there and he's saying, the law doesn't make mistakes. And they're like, okay, well, you were judged and yeah. you are here now. And he's like, yeah, but I didn't do it. And he's like, well, but the law says. He's like, no, but I didn't do it. Yeah. Like He, throughout the entire thing, like, Judge Dredd does not learn his lesson. He does not no. learn anything. He is the exception. And so when he gets back on his bike at the end, you know, and they're like, oh, we want you to be the head of the judge council and stuff like that. And he's like the good guy. And he's like, no, I want to get back to work. Like, okay, first of all, you probably need to like deal with some of those things uh, that happened because there was like a hell of a lot that you just went through. Yeah. But also like you're going to go out there and still like, even though you yourself were wrongly accused, you're going to dispense that same justice that was dispensed on you. Justice, right? Quote unquote. Yeah. Right. right? And without even trying to fix any of the problems or without even like, you know, like saying, okay, we need reform. We need anything. It's just like, no, back to the way it was. And for me, that's so frustrating because this is the hero. Yes. And so that, like you said, yes, this thing happened to me and this is the law, but I'm the exception. That type of mentality, especially for, in this movie, a cop, is not a good narrative. <laughs> like, it's no. it's just not, especially for when we're talking about, like, murder and stuff. And, and rightfully so, I understand where you're talking about, like, the whole narrative is essentially trying to force him to see that the law isn't just the law. That there are nuances within certain things and certain circumstances, and that's that, right? But he never learns that lesson. That lesson is never reverberated to him. We have Hershey, who's trying to tell him the same thing, but she also is somebody who's trying to uphold the law as a judge, right? And then Rob Schneider, who, yes, it's like the audience wall breaker to be like, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm here. This is what the audience is thinking. Sure, yes, but he was terrible also. (laughs) Because the whole time he was just like... Just, he was just trying to get out of it. He was like putting this weird thing and then he's just oh like trying to spend this whole time with the cannibals. He was just the like, gonorrhea yeah. thing. Oh he's my like, God. Don't eat me. I have gonorrhea. Oh, no. like- and then that dumb <laughs> ass, that stu- you stupid, that, du- that like super, super reductive gay joke, like gay rape oh joke. My God. I was that was so just curious. like, he's more worried about the fact that it's a man and a man and less worried about the fact that this man is taking this other man's clothes off while he's unconscious. I was like, Ooh, that's fun. So I, being gay is worse than rape. <laughs> I love it. I do not have time for this. Mm. Like, <laughs> we don't. Oh yeah. And like literally, cause he's like, do we, you don't think, do we think we have time for this? Like shut, like that's okay. That's not, really, it's I just, mean, it's so boring. And I think for me, it like that was one of the moments where I just like, okay, I'm going to take like an hour break because I'm getting really mad at this movie. <laughs> and with its narrative, because I wish, I really do wish there was. And the only person I can think who is redemptive in that way for me emotionally is Hershey in some way. Because I do still think she was incredibly flawed. And I do mm-hmm. think that there were some things that she did and said that I was like, ah, I don't like this as a character. But generally, she's the only person in that movie that I was like, cool. And maybe the guy who resigns because he's like, this shit sucks. I'm going to go out into the wilderness. I know that I brought and you up. And he's like, Obi-Wan Kalosha. Yeah, he's just, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. See, I'm going to bring law to the world. And, oh. and, it, that, and see, yeah. all of that was even just like so frustrating and jarring. And it was tough for me to get through because there wasn't really an emotional in for me to say, yeah, you like, yes, you're flawed. But I'm seeing growth as an audience because I don't think there was any growth in any of these characters at all. The only thing that we saw was <laughs> that head of police essentially saying that criminals are genetically bred criminals. Like he's essentially saying that crime is a genetic disease 
And that by itself is the most problematic garbage I've ever heard in a movie where he's just like, you were bred to be the perfect judge and he was created to be the perfect criminal and essentially implying that crime is, you're born with crime. You're born into crime. And I'm just like, this is... And the extra big problem with that is what they're saying below all of that, right? And that then they give him a fucking judge badge and they let him dispense his version of justice, which is, as he defines, like, everybody is eventually a perp, so we should just kill them all. Yeah, straight up. You know, they're oh like, God. they're innocent until they're a perp and they all will become a perp. Yeah. So he just goes on this, like, killing rampage and it's covered up by the police. Mm-hmm. And their whole thing with, like, when it starts happening again is they're like, we can't cover this up. Like, they're not even... They're not like, even worried about the repercussions or, like, the ethics of it. They're just like, we're going to get caught. Yeah. It's like, ooh, that's telling. Yeah. Um, so, okay, well, you touched on... Uh, so you touched on something <laughs> that, like... So, I have I have some points that I think that would be really interesting to get into. Yeah. Like, first of all, about, like, some of the world-building stuff and what they're saying about human nature. Yes. Um, and how we are inherently destructive. Like, we destroyed the Earth, you know. Yeah. We are destroying each other now with the riots and with all of that. And what it has to say about things like the wealthy and the poor. Like, how the wealthy people, we see them in the very beginning, right? Like, you get this kind of, like... It's supposed to be a funny moment, right? Where they're taking Rob Schneider to like Heavenly Haven. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you see these people in like pools on top of this place, and it's like, all right, cool. And he's literally like dropped into like a riot. Yeah. <laughs> and like, like, hey, this, oh, is, this is where you're heaven. saying. <laughs> Like, and it's so patronizing because what they call these things, it's like, oh, here's Heavenly Haven. And it's yeah. like literally hell. Like he's dropped in the middle of this and like, all right, good luck. Yeah. And then immediately he's like inducted into like this gang that's going to kill people or else he's going to die. And he's just like, I like there's no out for him. Yeah. Do you think that's a nod to classist structure in the U.S. when it comes to immigration? Oh. Yeah. Of people who come here with like, absolutely, I'm going to do this. But then they're given literally the least opportunity to grow in every capacity for the most part. Wow. It's just like think about thrown that. directly yeah. into like, you're promised like the best thing because this is the best place. Obvs, you're promised these things. And then they get thrown into the most dire situations where it's like, well, I just have to survive now at this point. I just have to live. Yeah. I have to live for my family. I have to live for this. It's That's exactly what it felt like to me because it just seemed like a direct, you're visualizing the top. You're mm-hmm. visualizing the rich and the like, I'm here now. Cool. I'm seeing all this stuff and then getting literally thrown into the middle of a riot where he can die. <laughs> like yeah. as step one, that being, and like you said, guised as heaven, as something that is good, as something worthwhile to be a part of, right? Yeah. And it's, a riot. Yeah. And just like the dehumanization of both the poor and the incarcerated and like the guilty, right? Yeah. Like, because nobody is innocent. Everybody is always guilty, mm-hmm. right? So like every single time they're just treated like less than mm-hmm. and talked about less than. Yeah. And just like dispensable. And it's it's so frustrating because like... You can see, like, the class disparity and how it is right there, right away. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, supposed to make you frustrated at first. And that's great. But then, like, we never see a way to get out of out of that cycle because that cycle always repeats. And even when you do the good thing, like Rob Schneider went back and just chilled probably at Heavenly Haven. Mm -hmm. We need to call them by their character names. Uh, 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 Wait. Ah, sorry. Uh, Um, Fergie. Fergie. I was like. You know how I know that? Black Eyed Peas. (laughs) So the... Not to talk about New Judge Dredd, but New Judge Dredd, uh, there was a Fergie memorial statue, and people that hadn't seen the first one or read the comics oh. thought it was for, like, Fergie, Fergie. the oh. singer and actress. <laughs> that is very funny. <laughs> Which is really funny. Oh, so, my gosh. So, um, just think of your London Bridge falling down <laughs> whenever you think of this character. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, good. But, yeah, like, the poor literally have to eat recycled food. Yeah. And they... I don't know. It really did bother me. And I think that that was something that kind of carried on throughout even like. Well, like you were saying about like just sort of the treatment of the low class by the government in this, they were so in this way. It was always so othered. And like they were like, well, we just don't understand. Like the police and the judges were essentially like, well, these people are quote unquote. Well, not even I don't even think they use this terminology, but to use terminology that we use savages. 
as a way to degrade an other and to essentially say like these uneducated people who are just prone to violence that a lot of people like to throw at in this country, people who are other people who are marginalized, they like mm-hmm. to throw terms like that around at them. In this case, they're justifying that by being like over judicial in this way. Like the judges are just like, no nonsense. These are the rules and you're going to die if you don't follow them. But I mean, that's cyclical, right? And that kind of intolerance to nuance is what digs the hole for these people and being like, yeah, well, if you're, this is the way it's going to be, then I'm going to fucking fight. Because mm-hmm. it's either I fight or I die, so what am I going to do? Well, and then the thing about the riots, too, themselves, is those were engineered by the judges themselves. Yeah. Because they wanted it to get so bad that then they would be given even more authority over the cities. And mm-hmm. not only are they treating these people less than and othering them, but they're also using them to gain more power. And they don't give a shit what happens to them, and they don't care. Yeah. Like, that... They're othering them and then using their, like, ugh. It, it was yeah. so tough. And that's, like, the first five fucking minutes yeah. of the movie. I This is, like, largely why I had a huge... I just... There was nothing to me other than the shoulder pads of the costumes that were redemptive in this film. <laughs> Generally. Because that costume was cute as fuck. It was so sick. So sick. I was so into that. I was just like, God. Yeah. Get, yeah. Oh, my God. It's just, like gilded and gorgeous and all of it and i was like yeah that's the only to me the only cool thing and i also i thought this was really funny i god when was the fifth when did the fifth element come out because i know that like at that time this version of sort of sci-fi futuristic uh dystopia was very similar but there were certain scenes that felt 97 97 it came out 97 this was 95 yes part of me thinks that maybe the fifth element there are certain elements of that that were kind of not necessarily co-opted but like influenced by this Mm -hmm. just visually like the flying bike scene is like similarly like bruce willis in the cab running from the cops past at mcdonald's and then like they run into the wall like i mean i guess that that's generally a trope in a lot of these sort of dystopic future sci-fi action films i think i don't know if that's necessarily a tie-in i think it I think it is just because it's it's a trope of the genre, like you're a trope saying, of the genre, yeah, right? Because like I felt really like watching this was like this film wants to be Blade Runner so fucking bad. Yeah, it does. It wanted to be it so bad. Well, the like, scenes because, when they go like, into the little shops and like the under like there was so many parallels and like the again like the propaganda type thing mm-hmm. and the whole like a lot of like the colors and the visuals and things like that. I felt yes. were really reminiscent. Um, and like you were saying, like the. The costume was like the best thing, right? And like, like for me, that's why I was excited to watch this is because I just remembered like the costume being mm-hmm. awesome and the Aww! line, right? And yeah. I was like, oh man, this is gonna be so tight. It's gonna be wild. And yeah. I was like excited, and then, <laughs> and then watching it, I was like, oh no, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> but then, like the other thing too, like so. Uh, speaking of like you know, retelling same stories and things like that, right? So interesting to note that they delayed this film getting made by ten years. Oh, because they wanted to make it. And then uh, but RoboCop had just come out and RoboCop took so much from the Judge Dredd universe that they were just going to be releasing the same fucking movie. No shit. Yeah. So like they literally delayed it by almost 10 years just so that way, like there could be some space between them. And when you are delaying a film because it is the same film or it is too similar like, I mean, but also, like, it's funny that they do that with, like, sci-fi, right? Because I feel like sci-fi gets a lot of shade because, mm. like, everybody's like, oh, oh, flying cars, whatever, right? But you're literally going to release the same fucking chick flick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it's, it's 100%. It, yeah. Like, back to back. Like, you wait years for this, but you wait, like, two weeks for that or just, like, some action movie with, I don't know, Tom Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So I, I thought that was like an interesting choice. I didn't know that they delayed that. That's wild. Yeah, I didn't know that either until I was doing some research yeah. on this. And I was like, oh, weird. I mean, again, I guess that makes sense, especially if it is essentially... It, it is just a derivative of the same story. And yeah, I mean, this did this movie do well in the box office? I don't know if it... I think it did. It did? I think so. I, it, was hu- it was like a huge budget. It was a... Big, big movie. Versace doing the Versace fucking costumes. Versace did the fucking costumes. Yeah. I know. That's so crazy. Can you That's... like... Oh, my God. I just... I know, like, when I go to, like, comic cons and stuff like that, I get so excited seeing people that do, like, a good dread. And I'm Ooh. like, oh, man. Yeah. So good. Like, it's like a, good on you. 
But um, I have a couple moments that I want to talk about that yes. I think are funny because we can get to like the Rico stuff, um, which is its own thing. Oh, but I have so much. I do absolutely love the names of these regions for this sort of new dystopia. Mega City One, which is New York. Mega City Two is California, essentially on the map. Cursed Earth is Canada, kind of. <laughs> oh my god! Texas City is the name of the other mega city, and that's you guessed it, Texas. And then there's Aspen. Those are the five. That's it. The on the map, on a map, the only five things that are visible are Mega City One, Mega City Two, Cursed Earth, Texas City, and Aspen. How are they allowed to name them like? I that? don't know, and it was hilarious. I absolutely loved it. I was just like, this is so funny to me, Texas. <laughs> Uh, Texas City. Texas City. <laughs> gorgeous. Gorgeous. That's so uh, good. And then Aspen. There's like, so many more guns there. I know. Oh, my gosh. Right. <laughs> gosh, she was dread in Texas. Let's oh see my how God. that Can turns you imagine? Out. Oh, my Goodness gosh. Goodness gracious. I don't want to. <laughs> no. No, please. Um, and then also, uh, Chief Justice, uh, when he's talking to dread and talking to him about, like, how he gave him the opportunity and gave him the chance to, like... Be glad he's like, because I saw the best in you and, and whatever. He says verbatim, I was barely in my teens when I put on this badge. And I was like, yeah, that tracks. Like, Oh, I didn't even catch that. He said, I was barely in my teens when I put on this badge. And I'm like, cool. So we're allowing teenagers to be judges who are allowed to literally kill people if they see fit. These all-seeing, all-omnipotent, strong, powerful, well-balanced people who are allowed to literally kill are getting assigned to this in their teens. And I mean, we do see a group of like kids when they go through the whole process, like here's a flare gun, boom, and then you voice activated, whatever. Yeah. And then the bike, it's like, it's a piece of shit, it's not working, blah. Those kids are also like 14. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I was like, that kind of tracked because I was like, okay, of course, like it's, like, it's a boarding school. school. It's of a school. course, it's like, you know, but like, but then it's he said even that more line. troubling, like if he got fast tracked because he was the, like the embodiment of, of law, right? Yeah. And order and all of that. He was a gen- genetically modified law officer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is horrifying. Yeah. I know. know. It's wild that, because based on that quote and based on like that scene with those kids, it seems like those kids were towards the end of their schooling, which is just crazy because, again, I'm using the term kids. They're kids. They're children to a certain extent, especially given the context of them being given guns and saying, you can kill this person if you see fit. Didn't you also find it interesting that that's when he was supposed to be teaching ethics and he's still blowing things up? (laughs) Did I find it interesting? No. Did I find it believable? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I I thought it was so crummy that like, I know it was supposed to be like funny or like a punishment or something that like, Mm -hmm. oh, what class are you going to be Ethics, and then you could see that like Dread himself is extremely uncomfortable yeah. at that because he knows that he's not ethical, and he knows that he's like a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think especially since this is a structured narrative, so the fact that this is what the within the story that the audience is going to be like, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. that, is that funny? Is is it funny to like scoff at and laugh at? the conversation of general ethics when it comes to terms of life and death for a lot of people. I don't think that that's, and that's again, one of those other things that I like had to pause. Cause I was like, this isn't good. <laughs> like this is in no way, like not just structurally not good, but ethically not good. These things, this movie is not good. These aren't good characters. I don't care about dread. I like, kind of care about Hershey. Who is Rob Schneider <laughs> again? Yeah. Who is Fergie? I don't... Okay, cool. And also the Chief Justice who's like, I have to step down now. I'm like, okay, maybe, but sure, go to the... Go colonize the other lands with your whiteness. Literally I don't care. bring law to the lawless. Yeah. Like, that's insinuating that people that live outside don't like... Ugh. Again, ah! law to the lawless is another... It's just... It's a, a reiteration and a re re reverbalizing of... The sort of savagery and sort of the ignorance and the unevolved and the uneducated. It's just, it's more of these othering words and terms that people in power, and in this case, the judges, use to other degrade and to marginalize disenfranchised groups. Well, and and wasn't it it also (laughs) crummy that like the the group, the Angel family that shot them down was very much fit exactly what they like... The trope that they were trying to say, like, oh, "Oh, these people, like, this is all of them. 
Yeah, like the brother that had this spine that was like a bike chain, pretty much. I was like, oh, this is a Resident Evil villain. Like, it oh, I guess so. So huh? much like a Resident Evil. Yeah. It was sort of like that. the um, like a cyborg. Ro- cyborg. Thank you. That's the word. Mm-hmm. I was going to say ro- roboid. Roboid. <laughs> I don't know where I'm trying to. F- oh my put god! I words love that together. Though. Robot cyborg. He was a cyborg. Yeah, <laughs> and even that whole scene. I just that was why. And then that's getting into the whole um, Rico, everything with Rico and how like we come to find out. Also, Photoshop. We love this scene with the picture. You can totally do that. This in Photoshop. Gore- Did you know that? I like, loved with, like, it. Just like a printout one. Oh my god. So in the same way that I loved in um, Blade Runner, the whole enhance thing and how like we've kind of like gotten to that point. Oh yeah. Loved it. This is like the and I'm totally clocking Matt TV. This is the Matt TV version of that scene <laughs> uh, <laughs> where it enhance where like this is like believable when we got to that point. This is just like a look at this photograph. I just, the whole scene, it was very much one of those just like, wow, like, look at this technology. But it was such a goofy little MS Paint business that I absolutely loved. It was so (laughs) funny. That scene was hilarious. I can't handle how funny I thought that was. Oh, my God. And so, yeah, then Rico's the exact opposite because he's the perfectly genetically modified villain or Mm -hmm. villain to the hero, right? Whereas... Dread is the hero. Rico's the villain. Rico's the one who killed those people, framed his brother for it, and now Rico and... Judge Griffin. Yeah. Judge Griffin. He is the one... Um, they're in cahoots, and they're essentially trying to like get him in. Yeah. Because uh, Rico is supposed to be dead. Rico's supposed to be cause dead. Because like, a big part of Dread's character is that he... I judged him, right? There's like the... Like, I have the line. I Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm getting so excited. <laughs> I have the line. Um, I think it was Hershey is talking to him. And she's like, don't you have any friends? And he's like, I judged them. And then he walks away. And I'm like... So dramatic. Cool. So you killed your friends. Love it. Like... <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So, Rico. So his character was like the ultimate villain or whatever. Who was given a badge anyway. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And then, yeah, he's just supposed to represent, like, chaos and narcissism and anarchy. And, like, literally wants to destroy the entire world and rebuild it in his literal fucking image. Yeah. And the the line for him where he said that he's going to create a free-thinking people and call them human. How does that sound? Like, what does that say about how this person who is a former cop thinks of people? Yeah. Like... It's all fucked. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fucked. I also loved how when he had, like, he, when he did the whole arm thing and, like, got his jeans and, like... Because I guess it, what they said, it takes eight hours to fully clone somebody or through the DNA create somebody in the lab. <laughs> but when he comes into the room and then he shows Dread... Because his assistant... His assistant friend who is... Oh, are we getting into her, too? Well, yeah. Because I think is. getting with Rico, she's, like... So... What I don't like is that I only think she was there because if we're doing the mirrored good v. evil conversation, we have Dredd and Hershey, and then we have Rico and Ilsa. Yes. Ilsa, Ilsa Hayden. Um, She's not Josie in my... <laughs> in yes, my exactly. Next, Twin Peaks. <laughs> so I think the only reason that she was there was to have a sort of mirrored image of the good and the bad, where you have a couple, a man and a woman, and then a man and a woman who are evil. Well, yeah, because, like, so she's supposed to be a scientist, that, and she's ready to take on this Janus project, not even knowing what the fuck it is, yeah. right? And then she, like, uh, so she's like, yeah, I'm here, I'm ready. And then, like, just, like, the whole time, like, it feels like she doesn't know why she's there. And she does, like, there's this, the the line that um, that Rico uses to to sway her to his side, right? is Griffin became my keeper by keeping me behind bars. What's your excuse? And I thought that was an amazing line. Yeah. Because, like, she doesn't even realize that this dude is fucking using her. Mm -hmm. And, like, but then suddenly she, like, gets all bad bitch and, like, has cleavage for days. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, where she didn't have that before. So, like, she, like, had to, like, rip her shirt or cut it or something. And then all of a sudden she knows karate uh, or, like, uh, knows how to fight, like, or, ah, oh, man. Also, also, even just that small moment, if we're going to dissect it fully, it's, again, 
tying female sexuality to evil and to badness. Yes. The moment that she embraces her badness is when, when she becomes, quote unquote, visually sexy for an audience. So we're again. The moment tying, she's a threat. Is she's when, a threat is when she's sexually, uh, well, like to an audience sexually attractive or yes. showing some sort of some sort of sexual appeal in some and, regard. And it's she's tying, confident. And shees confident yeah so back sexy, to our ghostbusters confident talk. women equal yep. threatening yep absolutely to the male audience because that's who this film was for it's oh from absolutely 100 right absolutely. so yeah isn't that just ah uh, uh, hard scoff hard scoff super, super i can't even scoff. yeah yeah i uh <laughs> it was just so tiring and then like the old uh griffin guy was telling her about her project and things she doesn't know like making her look unprepared and like un like so like she was being mansplained the whole time by Griffin and then mm-hmm. once she like gets out of that then she's like, Oh yeah, you don't tell me. I'm here. Yeah. I'm with I'm with him. Yeah. You know? And it's like this one line, like w- nobody in your entire life has said anything like this to you. And this one bad guy makes you like rethink everything? What yep. the fuck? Yeah. Like, ugh. Yeah. Like, and then what, Diane Lane was Hershey, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's get into Hershey. I'm so sorry. Like, I know I'm jumping around because I'm just a it's chaotic okay. mess. First, since we're talking about the women, I want to yes. I want to say just in general that women were not given narratives of their own, that they only exist to make the men talk about themselves and reinforce their storylines, and they're otherwise viewed as weak. Um, and that there isn't really a lot of women in this film. Yeah. So, like, they literally only exist in this to pull shit out of men. It's almost and like... And empower them. It's almost like they're a prop. Or, like, a dressing. A dressing, yeah. <laughs> they're so... Uh, truly. I mean, it's... Like, the more we do this, the more it's just like, oh, all of these movies do that. All of them treat women poorly. All of them treat marginalized people poorly. All of them are doing this. All of them have casual homophobic and rape jokes. Truly. It's just, it's all, yeah. 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 So, uh, femininity in itself is thought of as weak Mm -hmm. because there's the line verbatim where Dredd says, emotion should be against the law. (laughs) And he's talking to Hershey because she's emotional or because she th- feels this. And he's like, emotion should be against the law. And she's like, uh, okay, Batman. Yeah, sure. Thanks. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just, it's so hard because, like, you think about these stories that you've seen, like, and this I had never seen, obviously. But in other stories, we were like, yeah, there's growth. I liked that character. And then you go back and you're like, mm, was there growth? I don't know if I like this character anymore because it's nostalgic. We look back at these stories with such. I guess, whim- not whimsy, but like with such care, with such like, this affected me at this time in my life. And then you want to see the best in these stories. And then yeah. come to find out they're not the best stories. They're not the right narrative. They're not the greatest narratives. Well, but also like they were the best of what we had, though, on a mainstream. In a mainstream way. Yeah. yeah. So like my read of this, right, like what, like the differences we were talking about earlier, where I felt like this whole film was not glorifying dread and was just kind of like basically saying he is good at fighting or at doing what needs to be done. Yeah. But he is horrible because he has the biggest weakness, which is he has no moral compass. Yeah. And then and my he take, is unable to talk about anything. And then my take was just that this was Blue Lives Matter the musical. <laughs> That's my big takeaway. <laughs> And that's what I, like with no music. It's like this, no, the, the, the music is the gunfire. Oh yes, I'm so yeah. and the grunting. Yeah, the, the gunfire and the grunting mm-hmm. is it creates a yeah. Yeah, it does. But that's like that's the whole time. <laughs> that's exactly what I felt like it was. I I, I can 100 percent see where you're coming from because of that. It's like the best of what we had in that way. But even still, for its time, I do still think that like, ooh, <laughs> no. Well, for sure, we also like. <laughs> Even if you thought that this wasn't great or whatever, there wasn't really an outlet where you could safely express that. Yeah. A lot of generations, like, before and everything are so gatekeepery, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's something that has been the, – the breaking down of that gatekeepery thing has been great. There's still lots and lots and yeah. lots and lots of people that, oh, you're talking shit on Judge Dredd. Fuck yeah. you, fuck you, fuck yeah. you. Like, no, no, no. Just listen, maybe. Yeah. Or, like, just look at this, at like, critically as, like, a thing that maybe isn't attached to something that you love. Or, like, you know, maybe mommy and daddy were fighting and you went and you put this on and this was your comfort, you know? That yeah. sort of thing. Yep. And so it's... 
I think part of, like, as we continue to watch these things, like, we were talking about how, like, you know, there's so many things that pop up that are the same, right? Yeah. And so, like, and now, like, too, also moving into, like, all of these remakes and everything, they're not, they're more concerned with, like, you know, these little Easter eggs, like, mm-hmm. you know, from, like, the originals or from, like, the previous versions and everything yeah. to where they're not allowed, like, they're putting more care into that than they are into the actual story and yes. the actual characters and everything. Mm-hmm. So, like, I I have so much to talk about that with the next film. Yeah. But, like, what is it that we hold those films with so much nostalgia and, like, you know, and all of that? And the newer stuff, it's, like, it feels like it can't exist without the older media and stuff like that because everything is a reference to something else because even the fucking small things are like oh did you know this like it is created to have like a three hour trivia so it's like they like you can tell that they're making this for the fans but they're not spending any time on the story or the character development or anything to actually like it's like a it's like the highest budget fan film where it's like we're gonna do all of this and it's gonna be great without actually thinking about the product that you want to make because you love this universe so much you want to do it justice but you don't give a shit about the story it's essentially fan fiction yeah it's just glorified fan fiction with a budget yeah. Which su- which sucks, but also, like... <sighs> yeah, it does suck. Because, you know what? Yeah, spend time on the story. Spend time thinking about the themes. Spend we deserve time better. About- we deserve better. In that, in that capacity, and even going back to what you were saying about the whole gatekeeper mentality, and that sort of like, well, if you don't know this, are you a fan? Well, if you didn't do this, are you a fan? It's like, have something better. And, uh, okay, so this seems like a call-out post to geek culture, and that's not what I'm doing, and I need everyone to take a step back. I will take a breath. It's not what I'm doing. I am saying the gatekeeper mentality, I do think, can be toxic in that way because it does stigmatize ignorance in a way that is not healthy. Because, yes, enlighten me. Let's talk about it without it being shame, without it being, oh, well, you didn't know this? <sighs> Scoff. Like, yeah. it, in, in that way, and I think that a lot of that kind of uh, mentality gets in the way with remakes like this where it's like, well, we have to pay homage to X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, Y, J. Like, We have to do that in every capacity where so much time and care is being dedicated to the sort of gatekeeper culture in that way that when we are trying to remake a story, especially something as problematic as Judge Dredd, no care is being taken and no nothing is being considered in way of ethic or recontextualized narrative. Mm -hmm. So if we are taking an old story that was riddled with all of these fucking gross epithets and and narrative disgusting shit reconfigure that into a way where sure those characters in that sort of a state still exists but let's have a more thoughtful narrative within that that Mm -hmm. highlights the flaws in these things and highlights the people who are being hurt by that and highlights all of these things instead of just like did you notice his shoes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Did you notice that statue? Like, you know, just like spend more time on that story. Yeah. Spend more time really trying to make write a better story. A story that like should be told in a way where it's like if we're having a conversation, a big big budget movie about cops, especially now at this time when people are dying all the time, have a better story. Work harder to say something that is important and needs to be said and not the fucking color of the poster in the kid's bedroom. Yeah. You know, because that's it's inconsequential. It's an aesthetic. It's nothing. It doesn't matter to the people now and to society now, because I think a lot of what new filmmakers are doing are writing stories that say something, that do something, that mean something, especially in a time where people need that. People need hope. People need these things to like to be better. And when we're questioning authority when we're questioning all of these things about our own existence like having stories like that which i'm thankfully a lot of people are starting to do or being allowed to do or being allowed to do now yeah Yeah, exactly it's it's do more of that (laughs) like we should just do more of that and i judge dread didn't do any of that no Uh, i rambled and it's okay yeah it's okay because i feel like that was a good talk because like i (laughs) Because it is just so hard when everybody's just so gatekeepery, or they're like, "Oh, well, you don't understand," because blah 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 blah, it, you know. Like, and it's not it, that we don't understand; it's that, like, you know, we're diving into a lot of things that I loved growing up, mm-hmm. or that, like, you know, are hold really near and dear to my heart. But I like being able, again, like as we talk about all the time, to recognize that, like, oh, this is 
this is not okay, you know? And like, I'm genuinely excited for a lot of these remakes and a lot of these things that are coming out because there's so much potential and there's so much potential to, to do them justice or to like, you know, tell, like we were saying, like a a better story or to, to make things. And so I'm really, really hoping that we're going to get, start getting more of that. And by, you know, it's, yeah, it's I'm hoping. I, I, I mean, I hope so. Because, and that's the whole thing. Like you were saying, like you, you're hopeful that they're going to revisit these things in a in a really thoughtful and, and sort of in a, in, a, in a way that, yeah, I guess thoughtful is the correct. The word. more people that have analysis like this and that are showing that they actually care, yeah. the more likely that it's actually going to happen. Yeah, so. when we look at the care and concern that some new media that's come about, like stories like, say, Steven Universe, the care and consideration that goes into the narratives. It's so incredibly considerate and thoughtful, and that's what this movie completely lacks in every regard. There's no consideration. Yes. There's no thoughtfulness. The there's remake. no nothing. I can't believe I'm comparing Judge Dredd to Steven Universe. That's yeah. so weird. But <laughs> I'm saying just in the in the context of news stories and developing and re like I said recontextualizing stuff like this, like thoughtfulness needs to be at the forefront and agreed. It needs to be considered. Yes. Yeah. Like with Hershey. <laughs> oh. So. I wanted to talk about a couple things about Hershey. First of all, again, like we were talking about, she has a moral code and she has empathy, which are treated as like a nuisance and unnecessary. And then at the end, she's ultimately reduced to the damsel in distress, right? She True. is the prize. Yep. The only thing we know about her is like she graduated top of her class. And then she's supposed to be a good cop, but like literally like Judge Dredd comes in and does the mansplaining equivalent of what a cop would do to another cop (laughs) where he's like, like she's getting like some shit from this like rich dude. Right. And then he comes in and she's like, I got it. And he's like, and he just fucking takes over it. Right. And it's like, like you said, he blew up the car or whatever. But like, that's like the mansplaining equivalent, right? (laughs) It's like, you don't have this. But she's also like talked down to by Dredd constantly. And it's just so tiring because, like, she still flirts with him. Yeah. You know? And it's in reinforcing that narrative of we're supposed to like men that are condescending and emotionally unavailable. Absolutely. And she's he's just rewarded for being that. Like, literally, almost every scene, she's asking him about how he's doing or about himself or about his past. Like, without her, we would not have gotten anything about him. Like, maybe a little bit from the older judge, but, like, she, her character exists specifically so he could show a little bit of emotion. But She gets him and he can open up to this person, even though she's gone through, I don't know, a million years of emotional labor with this character and just being like, how are you? Like, let's talk. Let's do this. And no, he never once I'm asks strong. her about herself. He's like, the, really, he, he never asks her about herself, how she's doing or where she came from or whatever, and she never offers that information. She never makes him listen to her. She Mm -hmm. just wants to... She's just there to enable and empower him. Mm -hmm. That is such a disservice to that character. Yep. 100%. I mean, that's... It's just the... I totally take this from my boyfriend, Eric, all the time. He's just Batman. And everyone else is just like, well, you'll never understand me. You'll never get it. It's like, we get it, sweetie. Like darling we're all going through other shit too yeah but talk about your regular ass problems <laughs> your regular ass problems your everyday nuisances are the bane of your existence oh okay good fucking luck in life i have you... to take out the trash yes oh. straight up just like ugh. like <laughs> fuck <Yeah>. him we, <laughs> so we much i'll go through stuff like we all do things and like he okay also he didn't know about his fucking tragic backstory literally until like the last like 30 minutes of the film so he can't use that as an excuse because like okay like maybe his parents died or whatever is what he was told that's sure whatever that's fine and he had to judge his best friend who never should have fucking worn a uniform in the beginning but like even at the end like i wish like if he would have broken down and cried or like you know just been like i need some time off yeah. I would have respected that so much more yeah. than the than him literally like doing everything and getting back on on his bike and going back on patrol and everybody in the city who wasn't were, even there and doesn't even cheering. know what the fuck he did oh, like cheering him on like I feel like he didn't go through any fucking growth he no. didn't earn Hershey's affection he didn't like he didn't even earn the outcome that he got he like literally by the law should still be in a fucking prison. Because everybody True. that can say otherwise is dead. But also, even like, let's look at his line, I got to get back to work. So, 
the masculine manly thing to do is definitely not rest your body after how many days of absolute total exhaustion and trauma. Yeah. What's the cool? Like, oh, I'm gonna go back to work, and they're like, "Yeah, you get it, man. You're so tough. I'm tough." And it's like, no, no, no. This is an instance where I will literally say, "Go to bed. You should really go to sleep. Like, <laughs> not even figuratively. You should actually go sleep for a couple days because your body is fucked. I don't care how yoked you are. I don't care how jacked you are. Your body's messed up, and you need to go rest. But you're so tough, and you're so dedicated to." being a, like fuck just well, fuck, and fuck it's, right off it's so dumb because Ugh. it's supposed to be like a he's so selfless and he's just like a, he's, he's just a every servant. man he's a public servant he's every man yeah. right where he doesn't need the glory he doesn't need all that even though he does kind of thrive on that celebrity right straight up like he is just like gotta get back to work and it's like oh he's such a good guy yeah the only good part about that is when he puts back on the uniform I'm like yeah that's a sick uniform <laughs> <laughs> that was the only part I was he puts just it on like, I'm yeah, like ooh dang like that's sh- that is cute like that is such a good look <laughs> they, they did a really good job on like the aesthetic of this film oh, like yeah. it felt fun it felt cartoony yeah. it felt all of that mm-hmm. like like I, I'm i really it would have been so interesting to see how this would have been a serious film mm-hmm. you know compared to the like kind of goofy kind of campy thing like somebody literally had to like, and it was like, that's it. That's exactly what that's we're doing. One. We're doing it. <laughs> like that was a choice. Cut print done. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, okay. While we're on the subject of dread, um, I want to talk about how dread profiles everybody uh, where he says, I knew you'd say that. There we go. That's every the, single yep. time. He never smiles throughout the whole film is Always serious, but just, like, his thing with, like, everybody is just, I knew you were going to do this. And that's, like, a defense mechanism, right? Because, like, anytime he's betrayed or anytime that anything happens, like, his defense is, like, I knew you were going to do that. So it's, like, in his brain just kind of telling himself that, like, he's going to be betrayed or he's going, like, this is the worst case scenario and it's going to happen. And it's so... It's absolutely disgusting. I can't handle that. That, That was just... It was so... Like, not even just to add insult to injury, but just, like, literal insult to injury. It's so condescending, and it's so, so pompous and arrogant and just, like, ugh. And so the fact – and, like, even in the last scene where it's, like, Rico them, they're also, spoiler alert, literally fighting in the head of the Statue of Liberty. Which was gorgeous and wacky. But when he's, like, hanging there and he's about to shoot him and it doesn't fire, I'm pretty sure in that moment he says, I knew you'd do that. And then he, like, pulls him, and then he Rico falls to his death. Yeah. Rico dies. But it's still super trash, and it's like, it just reinforces the fact that he's had no growth. He's not, even in this he moment where he's, like, work. he's now being questioned, he's having an existential crisis in the middle of this whole thing where he's like, where do I come from? I came from a lab. My parents don't exist. I wasn't orphaned. I was, I never, I never had parents. I was never parented because... I was created to be this thing. And like, even amidst all of that and what we're supposed to see as quote unquote growth within this character who is unilaterally flawed, then at the end when it's like, he's supposed to have grown and like destroy the evil. He uses the same catchphrase that is just so disgusting, arrogant and condescending. And it has the same exact tone as it did at the beginning. And it's just like, Ooh. And that scene where the fight was happening in the head of the Statue of Liberty. Yes. Do you think that they knew, like, they're they're literally inside the head of, inside the embodiment of, like, freedom and what, like, America was supposed to symbolize to people. And they're, at this point, good versus evil, law versus chaos, all of these different themes inside the Statue of Liberty, inside of this ideal of freedom, yeah. grappling to see which one actually is freedom. Yeah. It was It was totally... Yeah, I think that was like super intentional because also the visual of it was just like, oh, that's sick, they're fighting on the statue. Mm-hmm. But it was also this aggrandizement of justice. It was this yeah. sort of like fantastic version of that where it's like, justice will prevail, freedom will prevail over evil and over the wrong doers. But, I mean, just as cartoonish as that fight scene was... It's just as unrealistic, especially seeing this quote unquote hero who we're supposed to like. He fucking sucks. So if he's the good guy and he's fighting for this, well, that just makes sense for America. That's just like, that makes sense. It tracks. Well, isn't it also interesting, too, that like he always achieves things through abuse of power and violence? Yep. And like, even when like Fergie could be like of use, like hacking into some system or whatever, 
his method is to just punch it Brute force. until it works. Yeah. He has like a master hacker right here yeah. that's like kind of on his team. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, nah, I'm going to punch it. Yeah. Again, <laughs> it's the dumb complex. Like, go to therapy. Go cry. Seriously, go cry at a movie. Go cry on something instead of punching holes in the walls. And again, I will say it, even though I know that we have somebody named Kyle who listens. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> the general Kyle, not this specific Kyle. And I know, I'm sorry, I'm using your name, but. The collective Kyle. The collective Kyle. <laughs> the collective Kyle does need to cry and does need to not punch shit. I know. When they're fucking, like, you're sleepy. You're sleepy and you're emotionally drained and you need to fucking talk about your feelings. You need to talk and just fucking, oh my God. Talk about it. <laughs> Judge Dread 2012. In a dystopian future, the majority of Earth has become uninhabitable, forcing humanity to reside in megacities to survive. These megacities are governed and policed by the omnipowerful judges who each act as the police, jury, and executioner. Judge Dredd finds himself having to give a final evaluation to a judge in training who, although unqualified, exhibits telepathic powers that some believe will be an asset to the force. After uncovering a dangerous drug ring on a routine call, they get trapped inside a mega block and must fight to survive. Gratuitous blood and gore ensue. These are the judges. This is their story. Okay. Let's get into this. This first thoughts. So, just first thoughts. First thoughts. Um, This movie is trash. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Was that my first thought for the other one? Maybe. Um, This movie was trash. This movie was very bad. Um, I took more breaks during this movie than I did the other. Uh, that's kind of surprising yeah like you probably could have just left it playing and just took a nap and then came back and everything would still be kind of I wouldn't have missed anything no truly I would not have missed a single thing I would have missed some things that I should have (laughs) conversations about classism and the criminalization of the impoverished like just the fucking scene with the homeless guy who's sitting there and just Jeez, I didn't well, need that. We like, didn't need that. And then he gets his comeuppance because he's literally in the doorway as it smashes down. That was fucking gross. That was disgusting. And it was so, that's what I'm saying. Like, So it was like, you better not be here when I get back. And then he gets back and he's like, you're still here. Sight him. And then the, we're on lockdown and the door just crushes him. And you're like, cool. So who was that for? Like, yeah. Who, so you wrote that. Is that in the supposed script. to be justice? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Like, well, and because they like they <laughs> start off talking about how I think it's like ninety eight or ninety nine percent of this specific block peach trees is unemployed and probably has nowhere to go, has whatever you know. So it's like, what is that saying? What does that mean? Like narratively, what does that mean? Just in the context of this movie. What does that mean? We absolutely did not need that homeless person no. in this at all. Like you could have taken him out and literally nothing would have changed about the story. So you're going to spend five minutes of this screen time setting this up just so you can smash him. Yeah. You're just degrading this guy. And then he gets back and be like, let's charge him money he doesn't have. And then just kidding. Story killed him. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Why? Just so you can see a pool of blood and a squishy squish. You hear my yawn? I'm yeah. so tired already. Exactly. True. Like, uh. my My first notes on this, like that for sure. This one is much darker and grittier, which is more like the comics. I think this one had the creator's blessing of the comics, Judge Dredd. Okay. So like the, the last one, the creator of Judge Dredd, the comic, did not like, said that it was trying to tell the wrong story and it was trying to say too much. And that it wasn't Judge Dredd, even though, like, Sylvester Stallone was perfect for the part, all that other stuff, right? But this one, he actually liked. Or he was, like, also part of, like, the conception of this. There was a part where the person that was writing, directing it, had met with the creator to kind of, like, talk about it and get his blessing and all that other stuff, right? And literally, the reason that Peach Trees is named Peach Trees is because it's the name of the restaurant that they had gone to to meet at. So he's like, how boring. <laughs> how stupid. Yeesh. That is like, yeah, that's yeah. such an eye roll. Um, 
Also, this is, it doesn't feel as futuristic as the other one, right? Like, there's no flying cars. There's no. It feels like it feels more like a bigger city, right? Like it's like literally supposed to take up the entire eastern coast. Yeah. So it feels bigger, and it's like what what was the thing that they said? Like that they can only respond to six percent of calls, which is wild. Yeah. Right. So like it's it's that big. They aren't even helping anybody like at all. Nope. So how did they exist? And it was just so much more graphic. It felt like a video game. It felt like a video game, the movie, because it like did. when it's like. You have to make it through 200 levels of blood and gore in order to get to the final boss. Like, that was so... (laughs) It was... I did appreciate how just goofy that felt, where it's like... Yeah. Like you said, it was like a bottle episode. It was like, you're trapped in here. We're not leaving. Let's go. And it's like, that's the story. Like, the whole story, literally the whole story takes place in this building. Nothing else happens except them trying to find and fight the leader of this drug ring, kill her, so then that they can open the doors and go back. And then... So so the the story is essentially set up. Uh, There is Judge Dredd, who is the coveted judge. Um, He is now on assignment to do the final observation or the final test for this judge in training who hasn't passed any of her tests for the most part or in a satisfactory way to what they say is passable but they do want her to take this test even though she hasn't passed thus far because she is telepathic and they think that that is a huge asset to the force as we explained earlier so yeah they go there it's a routine assignment and then lockdown battle at blood tower yeah well okay so The majority of my notes are on Anderson because this film was extremely patronizing in the way that it tried to empower its female characters. And um, so first of all, okay, you right off the bat, let's go with her telepathy, right? So she can read minds. Cool. Why did she not ace her tests or anything? Why was she not able to do better in school when she literally knows the answers? Because she can read other people's she minds. She can read a teacher's mind. She can uh, read other people's minds who are taking the test. Who are taking the test yeah. with her. So sometimes, as women, we dumb ourselves down a little bit to seem normal or to, like, maybe she was trying to, like, not cheat. Or maybe she was just trying to, like, just fly under the radar. Who knows? But, like, that is something that happens so you don't get that much attention, right? Well, She's well, already yeah. got attention being, like, a telepathic person. But, like, then her motives, too, are, like, she wants to help people because she grew up in a place that was just, like, Petrie's, right? So that's her whole motivation. But she's still holding herself back. And she's the most unconfident person that exists in this entire story. Like, it takes another judge woman to even give her a chance, right? So she was failing at all of these different things. And the reason that she's getting this final test is because this uh, woman of color, who's also a judge, is like, look, I know she's failed everything, but I want you to take her out on a final assignment. I want you to be the person to do this. And, like, Dread from the beginning is just like, well, she failed everything, so no. And she's just like, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta. And he's like, fine. Yeah. And like right off the bat, he's like being super aggro to her, being like, I will fail you if you do this. I, this is automatic failure. This is automatic failure. So he's like instilling, like, she's already so unconfident and fearful of everything that like he's pushing that even further. Like he's trying to break her already. Yeah. And then when they go and do the routine check that she picks, they get in this place where like it's like a drug den, right? And they grab the guy and all of a sudden she has like her psychic thing where she knows that this is the guy that killed the three people. Oh yeah, because we have that scene. And she says, oh, this is the guy that did it. And uh, Judd is like, are you sure? And she's like, I'm 99% sure. Because she still is doubting herself and her abilities, right? Even though she can literally know the truth in that capacity. And in this universe, it doesn't matter if it's... 99% is good enough to fucking convict. So I don't understand why they were pulling that guy around the whole time and being like, 99%, we got to take him in. So they're putting themselves at risk, too, because then, like, the lockdown happens because of that, because X, Y, and Z, and all the other things, right? And this perp is so willing to be arrested, and he is so willing to, like, not say anything. Like, he gives no... uh, Up until he, like, 
tries to like get in her head and stuff like that anderson's head right which that's the thing that we have to talk about in in of itself yeah but he does not try to like get away he doesn't like resist the only moments the only moments that he says that is when when there's a conversation about that is when he's like oh he's thinking about reaching for your gun he's no longer thinking about reaching for your gun that's it (laughs) yeah in that in the elevator or wherever whereas like literally this entire block with like 200 levels i think Mm -hmm. there was like several thousand people in there, like, at least, yeah. right? He could just say, hey, I'm right here! Yeah. And literally, he's just kind of, like, going around and letting him do the thing and stuff like that. Like, I wouldn't react like that. I don't know anybody, like, that if you are being arrested, that you are going to just be okay with it and that you're just going to kind of, like, let yourself... You're gonna, like... And also, considering no how bad the baddie was in this... yeah. How bad she was and how, like, she will do things to you you'll never imagine. Like, that whole conversation, that whole trope, for you to essentially just lead the judges to the place without any, like, fear of repercussion. Like, if she's as bad as you say she is, which in this world you've convinced us, we're convinced, we're supposed to be convinced at least. You would, like, like you said, in this huge tube, concrete tube, voices carry. So if you're at level one... Your voice could be heard in a small yelp all the way probably up at level 150. Yeah, that's true because it's just all this big concrete. It's, it's just going to bounce all the way up and that's where she's at. So if you're like, they're here, blah, then cool. Great. Yeah. It, I, I had a really big problem with all that because none of that made sense to me. And then like even the way that they were talking about her psychic powers too. Like, so it was absolutely a choice to have her not wear her helmet. And that was fucking bullshit because Dredd gets to wear his helmet. All of the other judges get to wear their helmet. But she doesn't because it interferes with her psychic powers, right? But she's able to read the mind of another judge who's wearing that. So by that same logic, she shouldn't have been able to read that person's mind, right? I love that. Uh, (laughs) I love that. Yeah. But like, but like, really, I think the true reason why they didn't want her to wear the helmet is the same tired excuse that we get in video games where it's like Metal Gear 5. Oh, well, like, it'll cover her pretty face. She doesn't have any clothes because like she breathes through her skin, right? Like that's, that's kind of what this excuse felt like to me. Yeah. And I hated it. And it's just because they wanted you to see her because if she had the helmet, right? She would not have seemed as vulnerable. She would not have been as relatable. She would not have, we would not have had a pretty face to guide us through this mega block, through this conundrum. So it was literally just because of that. Because if these two people just had their, um, their masks on, it would have been boring. Yeah. It's like the whole justification for the visual. Like you said, it's, unnecessary it's like doing a space movie and then the lights and the helmet and it's like you're doing that just to see the face you can't that's not real but also just in the sexualization or in this case since this is somebody who for all intents and purposes should be the strongest person in this story because of her power she should know exactly where to go and do whatever they keep having to tone down her power and strength both Personally, like she's doing it for herself Mm -hmm. to appease, like you said, uh, the male fragility, in this case, dread, but also just the look itself, because why why should we care about this lady if we can't see how cute she is? Why should we care about her if we can't see her and like check? Like, why should we care? They've already established that she's not very good at what she does. They've already established that she's not very smart because she's not passing the test. They've already established that she's unconfident. We've established that she's unsure of herself, right? You know? And, like, she's just being talked down to fucking constantly. She didn't need another handicap. No. And, if we're looking at that, by whose standards is she incapable? Exactly. (laughs) These tests? These tests in a society where literally everything's fucked? Oh, you mean those tests she's not passing? That's weird. She can literally read minds. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> and do you want to talk about Lord. that degradation scene? Yes, let's do that. Because I am very pissed off. When you think about it, it's upsetting on a few levels. Mm-hmm. So at the part where the perp is trying to fuck with her, because like he's quiet the whole time that the dude's around, right? The dread is there. And then when dread is gone and like, you know, then he's like, 
can you read my mind? You know, you're a freak, blah, 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 right? And then she does. She should know better, right? And then, like, it's him trying to fuck her and, yeah. like, just being really fucking awful. And then she's like, Ugh, uh, like, you know, you can tell she's shaken, but, like, she should know better. Like, she should know better than to do that. And then there's the scene where it's the two of them. In the dream world or in, in the his, mind? In, in his, his mind. mind, right? Where mm. it's, like, literally just... Let's get into this because Judge Dredd is using his physical self to like just kill a bunch of people and yeah. like, you know, power abuse, right? They literally just want her on the force so she could do shit like this where she is literally mentally beating the shit out of him, mentally abusing him. Like, because Patriot Act is cool, right? Like, you know, we want to know everything. We want to know all this stuff. So she literally gets to go in there and, like, see his mind, but only what he'll let her see. But then she, like, she intimidates him and, like, she does all the, It's It's just, like, that's the only time that we see her confident is when she's in this dude's head just for a minute. And then he twists it all around on her. And then she twists it around on him. And then it, and it's just, like... I have such a hard time with that because now that not only are they advocating for physical abuse, but they're like advocating for the police to use uh, like mental abuse tactics. Yeah. And that is so fucking awful yeah. as like, I can't even fucking fathom. Yeah. Oh my God. Like they just took that to a whole nother level. And I'm sorry. Like, I know I'm freaking out about this, but like no. that was the most fucking horrifying it was thing. It was terrible. And like, just even the visuals of it felt so unnecessarily gratuitous. Like, and I know that this film is gratuitous. It's like the dictionary definition of gratuitous too much, <laughs> way too much. Yeah. So why not in this scene of degradation, Show too much and do too much. And it did that. And it was just, it was gross. Not only in what it was, what it meant in the actions that were happening, but the visualization of like him making her go down on him in his mind. And then that not being her, but it's like his boss. And then it's like, she bit off his dick. Like, what are we doing? Like, what? We're going to get to talk about that biting off the dick thing what in the a little bit. What the fuck but- is this? Like... It just, it was, it was gross and unnecessary. And again, what sucks is that we're tying the one moment that she is confident to abusive power. Like the only time that she is confident and she is showing her strength is the moment that she is abusing her power to both manipulate and degrade somebody else. And it's, ugh. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that the single moment of confidence that she has is when she leans into her powers, right? So, and she uses that to like fuck him over, right? And then, like, she didn't need to say, like, oh, this is your world. You can do whatever you want. You don't have this, right? She's so confident in her powers that she literally empowers him to violate her. Yeah. And then she loses her, like, even at the end, like, she's still not confident. Like, that breaks her, you know? And it's just like, I don't, I can't. And I hated that that was literally her only strength was that and her empathy, Mm -hmm. which again, emotions are bad in this one. And it just like, I mean, emotions got her captured. Yeah. Like, and that was the whole thing. And now she has to be saved because of her vulnerability or quote unquote vulnerability in this case. Like what, what? And meanwhile, we're just getting like these slow-mo shots of like, bullets going in and out of bodies and like oh cool i feel like slow-mo was only there just because they wanted to do cg like because yeah. slow-mo like it could have been any drug it could have been whatever they this movie is like a love letter to gore and cg yeah which to a certain extent i can understand like doing making a movie that is just like bloody 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 right like horror films do that all the time i like i like some of those movies but this it, i don't know i i will say i did like the visualizations of the drug the use of it the sort of like mm-hmm. kaleidoscopy color thing visually i did like those scenes because i thought it was an interesting choice a visual choice and also the inhaler being like the delivery method for mm-hmm. it i was just like oh that's cool like so there were some small moments that i thought were just an interesting take on medicine or drugs in general, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be legal or illegal, however. But the tying of the two with, like, the asthmatic abuterol inhaler mm-hmm. with, like, the um, balsamic vinegar and the... 
uh, uh, olive oil yeah. drug in there where he's like, it's like a little lava lamp. And you're like, that's, that's balsamic vinegar. I don't know. <laughs> that's, you put, you put that in. No, I know. Prop department, get it together. <laughs> yeah. Make something better. You guys were all at just a fucking CPK and asked for it to go in a little container oh and God. then just pour that shit in a little glass vial and you're like, movie magic and it's like we know what that this is, is it. yeah <laughs> this is it guys or they were like they did that thing on the plate with like the bread and they saw it mixed together and they're like i think i got it <laughs> i'm just like oh my god go <laughs> oh, no <laughs> uh yeah. yeah i thought that it was kind of neat when like it was like such a good contrast between the world as it is as it is presented and the world on slow-mo because, like, you know, everything is a little bit slower and you get to see, like, the magic and, like, there's so many, like, colors and all of the things. So, mm. it, like, I could get, one, how that would be addictive and why that would be so sought after and become, like, some sort of a point of hope, you know? Yeah. Because, like, what the fuck do they have to live for? Yeah. There's this point where Judge Dredd says, in case you citizens have forgotten, this city still operates under the law. And that, like, looking at the statistics, right, like, it's judges can only respond to 6% of the crimes that are reported, and they haven't been to peach trees in so long that, like, oh, shit, it's a judge, oh, wow, right? And meanwhile, like, this woman and her gang have, like, destroyed all other opposition, you know, and just taken complete control over this block. And, like, the judges were nowhere to be found. So these people, like, really have to like they can't rely on the law how can they how can they operate by a law that they don't see and that isn't even trying to help them with yeah. like their super high uh, unemployment rate i i just i thought that that was so tone deaf and i thought that that was also just so such a big parallel between what we have right now right yeah well and especially that scene with the homeless guy like just that kind of classist arrogance that just disgusting unnecessary engagement like you're doing nothing to help anybody and mm -hmm. like the fact that you're just like that's the law and blah like go fuck yourself like straight up go fuck yourself i'm so tired of that like it is meaningless and it is degrading and it's unnecessary and then you claim to go and you like straight up shoot up the place and be like it's for justice shut up go to bed yeah, absolutely. And, like, I also hated that, like, this whole thing was, like, turning her from being, like, emotional, like, naive person into, like, killing people and into ultimately, like, losing her moral compass, you know? Yeah. Because, like, even at the end when she, like, becomes, like, when she finally actually becomes confident, it's yeah. when she just decides that she's already failed her test and she's not going to be a judge and her main goal right now is survival. Yeah. And so then she's a badass. And then she, all of a sudden, because she has that attitude, not even because she does anything, she has Dred's respect. He's like, oh, this person. Well, it was, right? I think it was the moment when she let the guy go. Uh, or it was the um, Star Wars guy. The Watcher, the guy who had the robot eyes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what the character's name. So she sees in his head that, like, he is being held captive. And sure, right. yes, he did these things and he's essentially aiding and abetting in this, in this way. He, yes, technically is doing something illegal, but given the circumstance, he is held captive. He's a victim himself. He's a victim in this current circumstance. And her seeing that, it's like, you know, letting a felon get away is whatever, whatever. And she's like, I honestly don't give a shit. I don't care. Well, no, she, she also said too, she's like, I failed my test when I lost my gun. Yeah. So, So I'm whatever. not taking a test anymore. Yeah. I'm doing what's right. I'm learning the new... Like, that was... That kind of a conversation needed to be bigger and not just this once where we're seeing somebody who has, oh my God, ethics? Um, for the first time in the entire film. Like, you're seeing somebody who cares. You're seeing some in, in again, yeah. in the limited scope that it was because I do think that her character is fucked in the same way that a lot of these other characters are fucked. But this small moment of like, hey, it's not by the book in the same way that we had it in the last movie in, again, the smallest fucking scope possible mm -hmm. is what the bigger narrative should have been. Like, have that bigger conversation about, sure, if you're going to have this character who's so fucked, dread, this flawed ass asshole, like the biggest shithead, have that other person be the main narrative to help guide this person into something that is 
bigger than himself to ta- think about other people, think about yeah. the consequences, think about the nuances of a class structure where there are so many people here. What do we do? What do we, how do, how do we have this conversation instead of just degrading the poor and blaming the poor? And, and they like, had the opportunity to do that with both films, yes, right? And they didn't. And of course, the way to tell that would be through a woman. Yeah. For both films. And it's so interesting, like in this one, because we did not get anything from Dredd. All we know is that he's a hard ass. Like, I did not give a shit about Dread at all. I wanted like, Dread to get killed. <laughs> like, like, I don't. Yeah, like, I he didn't was care about him. So boring. And so, like, I don't know. He just, uh, he was nothing. He was. So he's so boring. I'm so I know, tired. I know. Like, he, he was nothing. He was just a meat shield boy. Yeah. That's it. And then. Them trying to do the whole, like, crooked cop thing in conjunction with Dredd, and he's, like, be- above that. Oh, I he's for just, sure wanted to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, where, where now they called backup, but all the cops are, like, or all the judges are just as bad. It's like, what was the price? He's like, a million dollars split amongst four. <laughs> I mean, three. Like, yeah. like, okay, cool, 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 cool. We're loving this. We're loving the the deception. We're loving that that whole storyline. But Judge Dredd, the fact that he is now butting up against quote unquote a uh, sellout evil corp bullshit. No, you are literally just as bad, and you're trying to say that like you sold out. How much was it worth? It's like. Hold on. What do you mean? Yeah. What do you mean? Because you're a fucking piece of shit. Like, you're terrible. You're absolute trash. And now you're like, was it worth going against the law? It's like... Mm, uh, you are literally you- going to, like, <laughs> find a homeless man who literally has nothing yeah. like, and imprison him. And like- you're like, giggle at the thought of his death. Like, no, you're garbage. Bitch, you're garbage. You're hot, yeah. wet, messy garbage, and so are they. But you guys are on the same team, and you guys are all fucking cops. You're all, or you're all judges. So, I thought that that whole scene was so wacky. It was so wacky. It would, it was so unnecessary because it's like I know you think you're trying to make this scene happen, where it's like I'm by the law and you're sellouts, but you can't make that happen w- until you have diametrically opposed characters or so thoroughly thought out nuanced characters where you see yes this character is flawed but they are right in their thinking because they're growing and they're learning and they're changing and that's the hero whereas you we're your money blah 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 whatever no yeah the characters were so (laughs) there was nothing to dread there was like literally nothing no and so it was like we didn't even know if he was a good cop or a celebrity cop. Like, all the stuff that I know about Judge Dredd I'm taking from the previous film, right? Yeah. But, like, it's just, like, all we know is that he's just a cop that's... or uh, Sorry, a judge that's giving her her final evaluation. Yeah. We don't know if he's a, a good judge. We don't know if he's a bad judge. We don't know if... Uh, and I mean, like, all of that subjective and within, like, how the film was supposed to be portraying him, right? But, like, we don't know literally anything about him... We just know that, like, he's a person. And then, like, I thought it was so interesting about the dirty cops because, or cops, judges, whatever. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, sorry. I thought it was so interesting because, like, it just worked to show how these systems help maintain organized crime as well and how, like, they allow them to thrive and to, like, just kind of continue while they turn a blind eye when it's convenient and things like that. So I thought that was interesting. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's 100% interesting in the context of this because majority of it was not interesting. So the fact that they were trying to do the whole crooked cop angle as sort of a C plot or D plot or whatever in this, sure. But it 100% flopped because there's nothing to butt up against. Yeah, exactly. It's, there's, you're, not, you're not putting bad against good. You're putting bad against mediocre leaning bad. And since we're going to go to let's let's go ahead and talk about the vilified character, like the vilified woman. Okay. The and then leader. can we come back to Anderson later? <laughs> yes, yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. But if we're going to talk about Mama Madeline, mm-hmm. right? So we get to her. She's orchestrating it. She's the big baddie. She's like brutal. Is what everyone is essentially telling us, and what she's showing us. She's exemplifying it, it through violence. We're seeing that. We're getting that. We're understanding that. The final moment <laughs> at the end. 
when she, I guess, surgically implanted a thing in her arm that's tied oh, to yeah. explosives at the base of the building, but also at buildings around. She's like, how many people do you think live on the square block? Whatever. But if Dread, he's like at the final boss. She's the final boss. If he kills her and her heart stops, that is the trigger for the explosion of the bomb and it'll kill a bunch of stuff. She's like, so by killing me, you're killing thousands. And it's like, cool, cool, cool. And then they spend like, I don't know, a quarter of a second. And then he's like, do you really think that that transmitter can go through a million pounds of cement? And she's like, what? And then he kills her and it doesn't go off. And you're like, oh, that's it? (laughs) That was the... My, That's the apex? That's- my husband, so lovely, pointed out. He's like, it's supposed to blow up when it no longer gets the transmission. It would have blown up the second that she got out of range. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, really, really, really. What a, what a conundrum. What, oh, how is our quote unquote but hero she, gonna get through this? And then he's just like, boom, throw off the side. She's dead. The bomb didn't go off. He's so smart. Male hero wins. We got him. But she died like the same way that she killed the other people in the beginning. Oh, so, so it's isn't emblematic. That poetic? Got yeah, it. Poetic. It's poetic. Poetic. It's poetry. So I do want to talk about Mama and I have lots to say about yeah. her. So first of all, she was a prostitute. Mm-hmm. from the something something pleasure district who one day had enough like sh- she was abused right and i wrote this down because i was so fucking pissed off at the way that this was worded because i feel like it is extremely derogatory it's derogatory when they were trying to be poetic and the way that they say that she bit this dude's dick off they said she feminized a man with her teeth let Fuck. that sink in she feminized a man with her teeth. So, okay. So that's uh, like, oh man, right? But like, she turned him into like the, just, just, just the, the. I'm sorry. Feminized. Did a guy write this. <laughs> Obvi. Oh, Obvi. Jesus. <laughs> she feminized him. So this is because act- femininity is a horrible thing. <sighs> God. Again. And then she, so then she empowers herself through violence and through like, you know, this whole thing and just like, uh, just, and that's why she's ruthless because she was a sex worker that was abused and then just bit a dude's dick off one day. That's her whole fucking backstory. And something that I'm not super stoked on is so this character was originally supposed to be an older woman, just an old lady, which would have been pretty dope. Yeah. But Lena Heedy convinced them that it needed to be a middle-aged woman that was uh, sexually abused. So they rewrote that into the story? They rewrote it and cast her in it because she said that this is what needed to happen. Huh. It says she convinced them to make it her a middle-aged person with a male-hater personality. Ooh. Which is That's some fun so phrasing right perfect there. perfect for, like, you know... Dread the like pinnacle of masculinity, right? So you make you make the uh, vil- you make her feminize men. You make you make the villain question his masculinity, and there you have the worst evil of them all. <laughs> you have a mirror to fragile masculinity. You have a, a a a questioning of what is masculinity. It's like, oh my god, no, I can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> Mind exploder, and that okay, so. Yes, I do remember that phrase and that turn of phrase, that very clever, poetic, beautiful. Can we say it again? Because it's so. Uh, no, I don't want to say I do, it. Yeah, I'm be- so. I'm so mad at so it. So I. This is actually one of the breaks that I stopped at. Because when that happened, I was just like, "No, thank you. No, 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 thank you. I don't. Mm, <laughs> I don't like this." Because again, it's just like you said, so tone deaf. If we are to be on board with. Dread going against this bad person. We need to be on board and convinced and feel like we're on the same team. But that kind of language, that kind of like, and I know like in the world, it's like all fucked and everything's shitty and like, oh my God, PC, whatever. No, but language is so fucking important. So especially if we're looking at somebody who we're trying to go against 
you're really going to phrase this thing, this action in a way that not only puts masculinity on such a f- big chunky pedestal, but you're going to you're going to equate femininity with phallic symbols. Yeah. Phallic symbology. So the lack of the phallus is feminine. Okay, so this is just such a reductive, bi-gendered bullshit thing. And if this is now the narration of the people and of the goodness, I'm fucking out. And I'm not clocking back in. Mm-mm. I'm going to go home and I'm not going to put in my two weeks notice. And you guys can fucking eat it. Because I'm not coming back. Why would I ever come back to that? Why should I, as an audience member, be stoked on that? Like, no. You guys suck. Why do I want to care? I don't care what happens to Dredd. Kill him. Who gives a shit? He doesn't matter. I didn't give a shit about anybody yeah. in and this the, film. And the, the only... the on, Not even the only. I didn't care. I didn't care about, like... It was just bad. And that that is literally the type of thing within a movie. Like, again, consider it. Be more considerate. Be more thoughtful. Because if you're going to use that and, like it felt, you're trying to phrase something as quote-unquote poetic or quote-unquote different turn of phrase mm-hmm. you're trying to like revise this thing that happened using language like that does not make me want to fucking watch your thing like i don't care that's just such a boring straight guy i was feminized oh you got your dick cut off that's feminization that's By what you somebody consider- that was going down on you with her yeah, teeth uh, oh yeah, how dare her like and then that's- they bring it back right when like so there's the gross. whole like mental abuse scene happening right they bring it back where it's like you know the dude is like oh i'm gonna make you go down on me in my head and then it's his boss mama with his dick in her mouth like like but like cut off like yeah, with her teeth right and she's blood, like yeah. got blood and stuff like that but like fucking really like you're like that because that is the most sinister thing that a woman could do to somebody, right? <laughs> I know <laughs> that is the that okay. Fuck, fuck how we treat each other. Fuck how we treat the impoverished. Fuck how we treat people in any capacity. However, identified. Fuck it, skinning people alive. Fuck, fuck like fuck that. Fuck it all. What we care with about as the a dick society. That you just bit off. Straight up. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> I'm so nervous that she is going to bite my dick off. That is the number one priority. That is the number one evil. And that is the number one thing I'm afraid of. But, I mean, again, are we surprised that these fucking straight male people are afraid of femininity? No, because masculinity is so fucking frail and so fragile in every capacity that we... In this. Oh, uh, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. Can't do it right now. Okay. Yeah. Too much. And fuck this movie. And fuck that line. And fuck these characters in every regard. Yeah. Cool. And we're back. In conclusion. We're ready to be done. Yes. I... This is it. We're so tired. <laughs> these themes this lack of everything was so draining and exhausting and so in conclusion masculinity is exhausting and <laughs> men get it the fuck together and doing <laughs> and us women doing your emotional labor Straight is up. the fucking worst yeah. so cry so, yeah cry sometime go to therapy really go to like f- or talk or say learn more than three words oh my god the thesaurus is not a dinosaur. <laughs> it is a book with words and adjunct words. Or an app. You can... It's, or an app. It's, it's an app, dude. You don't need yeah, books anymore. You really don't. This is a sponsored post. <laughs> Download. By dictionary.com. By dictionary.com. Thanks, Matt. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. So, Judge Dredd, 1995. Who was it for? Uh, this was for... It was for, I don't know, who was it for? It was for cops. It's literally it. Yeah. It was just for cops to be like, yeah, the law. Like. The law is cool. Okay, boomer. <laughs> We're this, done. <laughs> this is for people that, you know when like you find a show that you really like and you're like, mm-hmm. oh, fuck yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, when like sci-fi was like Blade Runner was out and yeah. then like, which is fucking great. And then there was like. 
RoboCop and all that stuff. But, like, you need more of it, even if it's, like, discount budget movies and stuff like that. This is, like, discount budget sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to take my thing back. I'm going to say, so I'm going to also contextualize this. This, who this is for, is edited down to simply the moments where the uniform is visible. And with that re-edit in my head, this movie is for the gays. Oh, yeah. It. With all sincerity, that small redux edit of this film is for the gays. Because of that uniform. That's it. Done. Done. Done yeah. and decided. Perfect. That's what it's for. Uh, did we like it? Um, God, I loved it. I loved this franchise. <laughs> this <laughs> IP was just... It's honestly just like... <sighs> How are more people not talking about it? No, I hated this film. I hated it. Um, knowing that Rob Schneider was going to be, or like finding out that Rob Schneider was in it right at the <laughs> beginning because I had no idea. Um, I, for some reason, thought, I was like, wow, okay, this is going to be a little wacky and it's going to be an adventure and we're going to have a great time. Nope, did not help. He could not have been there any less than he was. I did not give a shit. I didn't like it. I feel like if this was just on in the background on like a Sunday where I'm probably like a little bit tipsy after like yeah. mimosas or beer or whatever I'm drinking on a Sunday morning because mm-hmm. it's my weekend. Fuck you. Like sure it'll be on while I'm like on my phone, you know, like scrolling mm-hmm. through whatever. Yeah. Just so I can get to the moments of like blah, 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 and just <laughs> Like, just to, like, point, just to look at the outfit, like you were saying, just to, like, have those, like, really dumb moments yeah. and just, like, just to laugh at because it's so bad. Sure. I 100% agree because that, no, I'm innocent. Like, the, just these small little moments <laughs> of, like, weird vocal affectations and, like, weird faces because Sylvester Stallone, A, he's got a face. <laughs> But he, what he does with said face is absolute insanity and is worth a watch. Five stars. <laughs> Done. Five stars sold. Oh, man. Sold me. <laughs> uh, for the gays. For the gays. I think so. Like there was like this um, the scene where like you could see his uniform from behind. Right. You mm-hmm. know, when he had like the big ass cod piece and stuff like that. Because like, how does that stay on? Right. And Hello. I think it was a thong. <gasps> Because, like, I was looking at it, and I was like, is that a string? Like, But it was, like, kind of, like, silhouetted and stuff. Because yeah. you never really see so him like, from behind. It's, like, sewn into the fabric to accentuate the butt. I No, 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 no. The cod piece on the... Like, so I think it's, like, oh, it goes over the spandex. God, and, like, it, 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 I don't know. It. I'll show you the thing. Maybe we can check it out. Maybe okay. somebody can write in and tell us if it was a thong or not. Because yeah. I, th- I feel like that is really important and would be really good to know. I mean, yeah. I do think it's... I think it's just... I think it's hilarious that Versace <laughs> made these costumes. I am so it's it's just ah, God, what a world. What a world. Like <laughs> oh gorgeous. Gorgeous. Like so it's so <laughs> it's so whatever it it's so wacky and I'm so thankful that I got to witness. And they're so this. proud of it too. Like it was like right there on the credits. Yes, it like- was. Boom. Oh, man. Okay. All right. So what about the remake? Uh, was this new, interesting, or the same? Uh, I'm going to say it was new, but it was so uninteresting and also incredibly reductive, mm-hmm. which is hard because that movie was not progressive. <laughs> that movie was not good, but it got worse. I feel like it was super regressive. Yeah. Like, and mind you, like, the standards are not high, but it was so much more trash. Yeah. It was not a good remake. It was not a good film. And it, it got even worse than, with, than the ideals of, like, because at least in, like, the first one, there was, like, a little bit of conviction, right, about, like, what you were doing. Yeah. And, like, you know. And there's and, her. She was like, I don't know what to believe anymore. And you're like, right. Okay, and, like, there's you questioning. Know, and in this one, like, it was literally, he was, like, teaching her that, like, you just have to kill. And then she just killed like it was nothing, you know? Uh, whereas, like, with Hershey, there was always that, like, there was always that hesitation. You know, she never left her moral compass behind. Where, like, you know, in this one, it was very, it was, like, 
it felt like Anderson was just kind of indoctrinated. Mm-hmm. And we didn't even get to the fact that she was like, even though she was unqualified and she failed her fucking test, they still passed her because I feel like the whole shared trauma thing, right? And like, so she's been through it. So she knows that so she's cool. She's one of us. She's going to, she's going to have our back. Yep. We didn't even get into that. Protect your brothers. Exactly. It's that oh. whole bullshit. That it's whole... that whole indoctrinated systemic trash where you have to cover your own because these are your boys. These are your people. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I felt like it was just so much worse and so not needed. Same. It was unnecessary. Who was it for? Oh, my God. Blue Lives Matter people. Eh, yeah. It was it was for uh it was for people that uh are afraid to have their dick bit off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, hundred percent. I okay. People that are afraid of women. That is who this is it, for. It's people that are movie, afraid of women. This yeah, this this movie was made for people who are afraid of femininity at large. Yes. In general. The feminine and feelings and feelings. Thank you, but feelings are feminine. Feelings are not male. So that's okay. Yeah. So know. the idea, anything that is feminine, <laughs> the color pink. You know who this movie was for? I think who anybody who's bought a black light poster at Spencer's Gifts <laughs> at, at at any point in their life. Anybody who's purchased one of those. Um, oh this, my god! This is for you. <laughs> oh my god! I think so good. Mm. Did we like it? No, no. It's gonna be that's gonna be a resounding no from the judges. <laughs> from the judges, <laughs> the judges, capital judge. Yeah, because they were so unself aware of anything, so they probably would have even hated. I want my money way. back. Yeah, from like the, I think it was like four dollars to rent this on Amazon. Yeah. It was the worst four dollars I've ever spent. It really was bad. With all that's considered, I will fully say, I am so excited to never think about this again yeah we're sorry that you had to i know honestly that. if like, you're following along and you are watching this and like then listening to us talk we're sorry that you had to watch these we watched it so you don't have to yeah it's you know really what? like we're here for you we're heroes we are yep i don't know i really don't know fuck this <laughs> i'm done all right bye so, we love you um Thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, you can write into us at nostalgiapodcast at gmail.com. I won't say the password that's here on our <laughs> <laughs> Password is <It's> blank. Uh, <laughs> we'd like to give a special thanks to David Tercero for technical support, uh, Danny Barkley for helping to edit this podcast, and rate and review us if you. Uh, are enjoying the podcast or having a good time with it uh, because or if you want to just write us some hate mail because of this episode feel free yeah would love to read it would love to talk about it how different do you think this movie would be if everyone just drank white claws because there ain't no law yeah honestly all right so that anyways would be, we're, we're uh not nostalgia podcast uh thank you eric thank you jess okay, this bye. Been fun. bye 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 bye